Hello, this is uh, Reinhard Christus from the Mission Control Center in, from the Austrian Space Forum in Innsbruck in Austria. Uh, today we have a telecon between India and uh, the part-time scientists in Berlin. So, Robert, please give us introduc an introduction to your work. Hello everyone, I'm Robert from Part-Time Scientist and I think the best way to is just to tell you who the Part-Time Scientists are. So the Part-Time Scientists are uh, working together all over the world to privately send a rover to the moon. That is our goal. I want to do this by 2050. And the reason behind sending a rover to the moon and why it is so interesting is actually to get private space exploration going. and. If you think about how space, have, space exploration has been in the past, then it was always like government government efforts. And the goal we, we are pursuing is actually to give the people the possibility to actually have a part in space exploration, to do more with space and to get easier access to space. And yeah, our team, as I said, is really a team of engineers and scientists. So we're really into technical things and just trying to find solutions for problems that people have since 50 years or more. So um, I will show you something of the work that we've did in the past two years. And I'm really looking forward to a lot of questions. So feel free, if you have questions from the audience, then just jump in, because I think it's, it's much, um, much more fun for everyone if you just I don't know, maybe have a dialogue and talk about certain questions directly. Just a short sound check. Can everybody hear me? Perfect, just to, to understand. Okay, just be sure. Can everybody hear me? Because I can't hear everyone, so just want to be sure. Yeah, okay, looks like this. Okay, but I can't hear anyone, so that's okay. Thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, talking a little bit about space, private space exploration. So, as I said, our goal is actually to get back to the moon over 42 years after we actually have been to the moon. So, as you know, the last man who set foot on the moon we're actually one of the astronauts of Apollo 17, which is the motive that you can see in the background. It's actually a scenery of Apollo 17, and it's over. It's almost like 43 years ago by now. And if you think about it, a lot of it, a lot has changed in the past, in these past 42 years. So normally it has been a lot of effort actually to just. It's still the biggest effort is actually to just get into space, but um, the, the issue is always with technology. So. If you think about space exploration, then the things that come to mind is actually that it's pretty, pretty expensive and complicated. So one thing that you cannot always change is that it's complicated. You can make things easier with better technology. Um, but what you what you can actually can do is actually to make it cheaper. So and that is actually where a lot of things that you all having today actually can help us it. So if you think about it, everybody of you, or maybe a lot of people actually have smartphones today. And if you think about the processing power that a smartphone has today, compared to the entire processing power of the Apollo program, then you can easily see that it would fit the entire supercomputer of the Apollo program. So and that is actually an interesting fact that brought me to consider privately going back to the moon about four years ago. So I was thinking to myself, if it is possible today to solve problems better today that we had maybe 40 years ago back, so why shouldn't we do it? And that is the point. So. The thing that we did when we started out with our mission was the very first thing was actually assembling a team. And as I said, it's a let's say it's a free group of people. We actually always encourage people to join our team. And as I said, so it's a team of engineers. So the first thing we actually did was trying to come up with a way to get back to the moon and actually find ways to make it simpler. So and the first way we started out was actually think, finding a way to build a moon rover that is actually simpler than the versions we had before. So you have to understand one thing. So we have to are participating in a competition, which is the Google Lunar X Prize competition. And it's a competition, it's more like a bet that is set out by the guys from Google, which, who actually say that the first private person who gets back to the moon um, will actually get 40 million US dollars. So it's more like, I don't know, it's a bet to actually to see who wins first. And it's, it's a so-called incentive prize. The idea is that a lot of people try to achieve this goal and go back to the moon. And you know, it's, it's, it's most likely that not so many people will actually succeed on their way, but a lot of interesting technology and um, 
let's say, solutions will be found that actually make things easier for every one of us and make space exploration easier in the future. So to maybe start out with some practical fingers, we'll take my laptop and show you something. So when we started out designing the parts for our mission, the first thing we thought about is actually, is there a way to um, build a, let's say, a simple exploration device? So one part of our mission is to actually, of course, land on the surface, but um, also, of course, explore the surface of area. And if you think about moon rovers, or let's say Mars rovers, because they haven't so been so many moon rovers as of now, um, if you think about Mars rovers, then you can always remember rovers that have six or eight wheels. So the challenge that we were really facing is actually figure out a way to design a system which, which actually has four wheels. The reason for having only four wheels is actually because you have less weight requirements. And every wheel contains, let's say, of two drives. There's the two brushless drive in this system, one to, um, to, to steer the drive and one to actually have a drive in one direction. So actually have two drives per wheel. So And this actually has brings up a lot of power consumption. So you actually have an incentive to, let's say, have only four wheels instead of six or maybe eight. So and that is the reason why we've tried to develop a four-wheel design. And building something with four wheels is one thing, but actually proving to the scientific community that it can be better or even as good as um, as in six or eight wheel design has been a lot of effort. This is our very first test setup. It's, it's the as we call it the Asimov as uh, a one rover, and it's basically just an FPGA test system. So the electronics that we're using are FPGAs. I don't know if how familiar you are with the term FPGA, but just give you a very basic description. An FPGA, the FPGA is actually a very special computer chip. It's a little bit like a CPU but in a way that you can actually program your entire circuitry, so a normal circuit board, onto this little chip. So it's like a, a free programmable circuit board. So and an FPGA is really, really good for very specialized tasks. It's a technology that we only got for the, OK, it exists for about 10 years or so by, by now. But the, the, the quality level that we have today of the FPGAs is really, only for the past five years, has been really good. and. Today, with FPGAs are really everywhere in all the things that you know. So for example, if you have a high-end HD video camera or a professional, professional um, TV show that is recording something, then they have FPGAs everywhere because they're really good for specialized tasks. And that is why we've tried to make FPGAs work with our rover system, because we really thought that having a chip that is, can be optimized for a very special task, like driving around or controlling four wheels on the surface, was the best way to go. And there's also another reason, because there are many different issues when you go to space. And a very, I will give you an overview of the maybe three key problems that you have when you go to another planet or actually when you send something into space. The main issue, of course, it's, it sounds stupid or sounds at least silly, is actually to get in space, because you always have the issue of getting away from Earth. So that is actually the thing where you need a launch vehicle for. So and that is the only thing where you, let's say, can't optimize so much things because there is no easy way as of today to get away from Earth. So once you're in low Earth orbit, then you're facing another problem, which is a high amount of radiation, which only gets worse the farther, further away you get from Earth. So you're actually having an issue because today, for example, you're having maybe you have your smartphone here on Earth, which is great, but um, Maybe it, it, it's working perfectly, but if you take it, for example, into space, then you will actually see that it's maybe fried in less than 10 seconds. And the reason for this is that you have, for example, on the way to the moon, for example, our um, rover catches up 500 times the amount of radiation that it catches up here on Earth. And it is due to the fact that there's no um, ozone layer, so there's no, um, sorry, I'm just looking for the right word, so there's no, 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 no protecting shield. So the, the Earth actually has an, it's not an ozone layer, but actually the Earth has actually, let's say it's a magnetic shield, which is um, protecting us from a lot of amounts from radiation that is coming from space. And this is something that the Moon doesn't have. And only the Mars, for example, have it partially. So they actually have a lot more radiation to cope with. And a great advantage, for example, of the FPGAs that we have as today is that, you, that these chips can actually repair themselves to a certain degree. So for example, if they are damaged at some point, they can actually reallocate part of their functionality to another area or to another FPGA. And it's 
tiny simple technologies like these that can actually help you solve problems a little bit better because you have to know one thing for example that the integrated circuits that we use today everywhere they're actually the development of the Apollo missions so I think the very first integrated circuit that was ever built was actually for the Apollo missions so and so you actually see and back then actually the integrated circuits were so simple that they couldn't be harmed by radiation so if you think about a circuit with the size of this and um, with very big wires then actually let's say a simple um, single event upset or a simple overcharge in the wires could ac couldn't actually cause much damage but as of today we actually have miniaturized a lot of functionality into very small chips then yeah a little bit of a little tiny amount of radiation can cause a lot of damage so and let me show you the advanced version that we've did so only six months later we've developed the basic design of the um, Asimov rover as we called it and it's this, the design that we are um, as of today still going with and as, it's, as I said it has four wheels that's the basic definition but the interesting thing is that something that we had to figure out is actually that the critical component that you have in space is always your energy budget so there's a lot of things that you can do but you can never get more energy you can bring batteries with you but at some point these batteries will be empty but you can only bring let's say a certain size of a solar panel with you the only other option would be RTGs which is radio which stands for radio isotopic generator um, which is more like a let's say a little nuclear power plant that you have with you um, so it gives you it gives you it provides you with a lot of energy but um, it's not actually very easy to use for space mission and of course it's not possible to use for our mission so the way that we have to go and that almost all space missions go these days is actually with a solar panel and the size of the solar panel actually defines how much energy you will have for your mission so for example if this solar panel is for example a little bit smaller than it is right now this energy wouldn't be enough for example for the rover to operate in this case actually the mission would be a failure so the size of the solar panel really defines the size of the rover which again defines the weight of the rover and this again defines the amount of let's say capacity that we need in our launch vehicle to get to the moon so and to optimize the solar energy throughput actually one thing we did is that we made the solar panel tiltable so you can actually the rover can drive in any direction it has no really no back and forth because the wheels can turn around 360 degrees in all directions and the solar panel can be tilted to both sides so it can always be aimed at the perfect sun angle yeah and yeah that is actually the basic idea behind the um, behind optimizing your system design experts for space purposes so and another interesting thing I want to show you just talking about technical things because I think this it just shows you how you can actually do things let's say a little bit better than you could a few years ago for example one thing that we've been thinking about quite a lot at the beginning was actually if you want to send something to the moon then of course you need the energy over there that's definitely for sure but what you also need is communications and just from a physical point of view your solar panel and your antenna if they are optimized for let's say efficiency they're always taking up the largest surface amount of your vehicle so the, the largest surface area for example always takes up the solar panel or the antenna or actually both so another idea was to if we have two things that wants to have as much surface area as possible why not combine them and that is the reason why our solar panel looks a little bit I don't know how to describe it it's a little bit um, with a, it has a lot of gaps and tiny cells so and the goal act the reason for this is be because we started out developing um, a so-called phased array approach so the idea was actually to integrate the antenna into the solar panel itself so actually combining two technologies in one device and this is something that is for example also just been possible for the past three years because the right circuitry that you need for this to actually make this possible has only been available in the right size because you need chips that actually fit into this device and actually into your weight description, mass description for your entire mission so and this chips has only been available for like two years there have been of course solutions for this previously but they have been too big too, they have too much too high amounts of mass and that is always an issue so 
You have to think about that every kilogram that you send to space actually costs you millions of dollars. And you have to think about that you're always calculating your costs for your mission um, by mass at a certain point in space. For example, getting a kilogram, for example, into low Earth orbit costs us, I don't know, one, um, one certain amount of money, but getting this kilogram down to the surface of the moon costs us much more money. Because you have to think about it that it's actually, there is, um, there's a whole lot more technology involved to getting this one tiny kilogram onto the surface of the moon. And so the, actually the idea, is act, so the idea is always to use as less technology as possible and the lowest weight restrictions on us. So, and a lot of things that we've been doing is that we've been working with something that probably most of you are familiar with, it's a rapid prototyping technology. In this case, so, or simple terms like would be 3D printing. So, and one thing that we're always doing is that we've print out all the entire, all the new prototype units that we are building. The same is true also for our lander models, because we are also building, as part of our mission, a lunar lander, which is able to land on the surface. And we're always um, building 3D printed versions up front. At some point, actually, this material is really, I don't know, it's really rough. So actually, it can actually work as, as prototypes, which is something that surprises us a lot. So because if, if you think about this material, then you would never actually think that it could survive some real life testing, but it actually does. And yeah, but, but and from our development point of view, we're always just ordering one unit like this one over there, which looks a little bit white in 3D printing. And if it works out, or if we, we know what we want to adjust, then we will order it as a metal or aluminum version. So actually more rough parts. So that is the reason why, for example, the prototypes behind me look so, let's say, white or yellow. Yeah, and this 3D printing is actually also something that, as of today, helps you a lot develop technology for space in a much faster and cost-efficient way. Because um, if, you think back, if you think back some years ago, Building a prototype was one of the most expensive things. Even, even these prototypes behind me, even this little one, has a value of about almost up to 100,000 euros, which is a lot of money. But if you think about building these out of real metal parts up front without knowing that everything will work, then it would cost a lot more money. And that is the point. So it's, it's actually 3D printing really gives you the ability to develop things quicker and more cheaply in the long run. And yeah, this is the reason why we started out with this generation approach of building technology. Okay, um, yeah, so much basically for the entire thing. Uh, maybe something that I should mention is the entire way that our mission is working, the overall design. So our goal is actually to um, be part of a rocket, which is in our case the uh, Russian Dnepr rocket. I can, I don't know, can actually show you some videos of it later, but um, the Russian Dnepr rocket is actually the launch vehicle that we are, for example, looking towards to use for our mission. And the goal is actually to get our um, get our mission, get our mission hardware, which is our rover, and our transfer vehicle. So our lander and transfer vehicle is actually the, the same thing. So we actually want to get to low Earth orbit, and from there we actually want to go in one way to the moon. So there's, there's many ways to get for example, to another planet. For example, one pretty straightforward way would be if you have the big enough kind of rocket, then you can actually just launch from Earth and get to the moon directly. Designs like this have been played through by people. Um, but, you know, um, the, I think the, the way that is more cost efficient for us in, in this example is actually to get to low Earth orbit first and then you travel to the moon. Which makes things a little bit more complicated because you're actually having you need two different parts of engines. You actually need engines that get you from the Earth to the low moon orbit, LMO. And once you're in low moon orbit, you actually need, let's say, a different, at least a different kind of engines to uh, get down safely to the lunar surface. Because one thing that you want to do visiting another planet, for example, like the moon, then you actually need to um, do a soft landing. So the, the difference between let's say, or, or actually what is a soft landing, to actually explain it. Um, a soft landing actually means, it's not as so soft as it sounds, it actually just means that you get as low as possible before the surface, before you're turning off your engine, so actually, yeah, let's say, that nothing of your payload gets damaged intentionally. So there actually have been different ways of landing, for example, planets that have an atmosphere, like Mars, actually you can actually use 
I don't know, different approaches like the sky crane that Curiosity used. But the moon doesn't have any atmosphere, so the only way that you can land on the moon is actually with uh, fueled engines. So, and that is actually not so easy in this case. And it's actually you always have a problem that at some point on top of the surface you have to turn off your engines, so there's always a free fall when the system sets down. So, um, one of the issues that we were having, for example, was figuring out a way for um, our lander to land on the flat surface without breaking one of its legs. So the lander the design that we have actually has four legs right now. And the legs, for example, are actually compressible. So once they, they touch the, the lunar surface, they actually compress to a certain degree. And they can, of course, never move back in any way. But they actually get um, yeah compressed. And so they're actually sitting, they're, they're taking up a little bit of the kinetic energy that you have from the free fall to the surface. But still. The free fall that you can have towards the surface can't be more than like three to five meters without damaging anything. And that is actually a pretty complex thing. So, um, but the greatest thing is actually, as I said, that is that you, today you can actually do some things like this. So that is actually what we want to prove. We want to prove that if you are out there and if you are an engineer who have, has a good idea and actually wants to do something in space, then today is actually your chance to actually get this done because. And that is what we want to promote, is actually that private space exploration is possible, and it's something that you can actually follow up. So, for example, if you think about something of maybe you might have heard of already is about CubeSats. I don't know, CubeSats actually, for example, are 10 by 10 centimeter little cubes of satellites who are actually uh, taking up the waste space. Let's say, let's not waste space, but there's always space in rockets that uh, bring satellites up into low Earth orbit, which is not actually being used. And it's getting filled up by, let's say, filling material, which is not very usable. It's something that just gets blown away when the satellite launches. So why not use this space for something that makes sense? So, But if you think about like 10 years ago, if somebody would have proposed building a satellite, which is only 10 by 10 centimeter in a cube size, then you couldn't have done much with it because the, all the electronics that you could have put into the satellite would have been way too big or way too heavy or would have been, for example, using way too much energy. But as of today, with a lot of miniaturization and optimization, you can actually use these material, these CubeSats, pretty efficiently. And yeah, that is actually something, for example, a lot of these CubeSats are used to um, test drive ion engines that people are building. So there are actually people out there who are building their own ion engines, putting up a CubeSat and launching them into space, which is something which I found quite exciting because it actually shows that you can get to space and do something in space without being, for example, a space agency. OK, uh, maybe some questions or something that have, has arisen as of today. Uh, right now, sorry. Okay. So do you have questions? Uh -huh. Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. We are happy to hear from you. Uh, really, you explained well about the challenges and the difficulties that we are facing in the spa uh, space travel. And also, we can understand all that you explained about the uh, rocket soft landing and hard landing. So, our students are right here to ask so many questions uh, regarding space. Are you able to hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you, but I, sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, so you were, um, the question was about the uh, landing or space travel, or yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I will give the mic to the students. They will ask now. Hmm? Sorry, I didn't, didn't understand it. Sorry. Uh, our students are ready here to ask questions to you. Can they ask questions? Yeah, if the students can ask yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Sorry, uh, maybe. Okay. Uh, our students will introduce themselves and ask you. Okay, first I invite uh, Sudesh. Can you come here and ask your question? So here, yeah, uh, Sudesh is going to answer this. Sorry. Hello, my name is Sudesh. My name is Sudesh. Hello. My name is Sudesh. 
Hello, we can hear you. Continue with your question. Okay, that's perfect. Hmm? Sir, could you please explain us to about the satellite Voyager, which crossed the solar system? Where is the satellite now, and what are the benefits we are getting from the satellite? Sir? Which satellite? The name? Why? Could you please explain to us about the satellite Voyager, which crossed the solar system recently? Uh, I think you mean Voyager, the the Voyager spacecraft. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe you want to answer this question. I just want to. Um. Okay. Yeah. Hmm? So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft. Uh, there are actually two of them, and uh, Voyager two recently uh, left the solar system, um, and crossed into interstellar space. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, I mean the spacecraft has been around for more than 30 years and uh, will continue on its way out of uh, the solar system because there is nothing that will stop it because space is empty mostly, so it will continue on its journey. Um, yeah, um, the, so I think that I don't know how much longer it will operate, a few years, but then the power supply will be. Uh, not in, will not be enough to operate it anymore, but um, I don't know much more about that. Uh, I ha would have to check actually. <laughs> so. yeah, but I think it is one of the maybe biggest accomplishments that uh, mankind made so far in space exploration, because having an object, the farthest object, man-made object here in space. Yeah. yeah. Now the next question is from uh, Bessia. So we ask the question. Hello. Hello. I would like to know whether aliens are in space. Often we hear about aliens from other planets. Is it true, or is there any living beings in other planets? Okay. Interesting questions. <laughs> would you like to go ahead, Robert? Hmm? Would you like to go ahead, Robert? Yeah, I would. Uh, well, at least I will try. So um, I think it's a statistical question in this case because um, I'm wondering about is let's say from this perspective. Personally, I believe that there is other life in space out there besides us because, right? Just from a statistical point of view, it has to be. Let's put it this way because there is so much space and there are so many planets and worlds out there where people are. In this case, people would be aliens for us, but where other life forms could actually live and evolve. So, from my personal feeling, they have to be out there, but the problem is that, I don't know, due to the fact that space is really so big, that maybe we will never meet them. It's maybe a little bit of a sad fact, but, yeah. So, uh, yes, I believe there, there is something, or there are some other life forms out there, but, yeah, maybe we will never meet ET or something like this. Yeah. So oh, the, the, yeah, the, the point is we have never, we haven't found any other life yet yeah. on any other planets. Yeah, but maybe we so will. As far as we know, there, there are no aliens. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Because today there are no aliens. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is by Abia. Next question is by Abia. I'd like to ask, what is the force responsible for the planets to revolve in elliptical orbits and not in circular orbits? What are the reasons behind it? I'm sorry, I didn't just get the entire question. Yeah. What is the force responsible for the planets to revolve in elliptical orbits and not in circular orbits? And what are the reasons behind it? <laughs> Usually revolve in elliptical orbits, no? Because he's asking why. Yeah. Um, uh, do you like to answer that, or? <laughs> no, no, maybe it's better which we answer. Me or you? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, okay, so yeah, planets and other celestial objects are in elliptical orbits. Um, but the thing is, uh, that has to do with the. A creation of uh, a solar system. So, because a circular orbit would be a perfect orb orbit. Yeah? It has no eccentricity, so that 
it is a circle. Uh, but the more um, uh, the more influences that there are, disturbances, the more uh, it gets into an elliptical orbit. So if you look at uh, the orbit of uh, Venus or Earth, for example, that is almost a perfect circle, but not it is not perfect, so it's a little bit elliptical. But if you look at the orbit of, uh, for example, um, the dwarf planet Pluto, that is highly elliptical. And comets, for example, are even more elliptical. Um, yeah, but it has to do with the, uh, basically with the influences on the creation in the processes. Because if you have only the sun and one planet, and that's it, then you could have a perfect circular orbit and you're, you're good. But uh, because there are many, many different objects and many, many different masses uh, in space that influence each other, you get different orbits. And yeah, but we can only actually s tell that it is it is this way. It's difficult to explain it why it is like this. This is like a question: Why does the Earth turn? Um, yeah, I would have to spend the next few days to explain that. So. <laughs> Okay, we have a next conference, maybe next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the uh, answer. Then another next question by Tony. Tony. Tony is asking question. May I know why is it is said that the black hole has no extent in the space? Sorry, can you repeat the question slowly? Why is it said that black hole has no extent in space? A black hole. Um, black hole. Okay. Black what hole. is a black hole? And why is it said? I mean, uh, why is it said like this that the black hole has no extent in space? Um, I said that is, there is no extent uh, for black hole in the space. That's what he is asking. Why? Uh, I didn't. I, uh, black holes, yes, but I didn't understand the. Last the thing the you last said. Part of the, the, the question here. Um, yeah. So, what, what is it with the black hole that is actually the question? Uh, you can just explain what is black hole. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, Robert, would you like to explain the black hole? Actually, I really believe that you are the better one to explain this. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. I don't want to hand any question over to you, but I will. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, a black hole uh, is basically um, when a star or something even more massive than a star is uh, collapses, yeah, into itself. Uh, at some point, um, it is so dense, at, uh, which basically means that you have a lot of mass in a small uh, area. So for example, if I take uh, Earth and I compress it to the size of my thumb, then it would be a black hole. Yeah? Because the density is so high that not even light can escape. Which is also interesting because uh, um, I think the best way to explain it is a black hole is a singularity in space, which means um, space itself is um, Warped. So, if you imagine, um, for example, uh, a piece of uh, a paper, okay, and let's assume that space is only a piece of paper, and if you put uh, uh, something heavy on it, the pa paper bends down on that place, okay, and a black hole is basically if you put something so heavy in one spot that you actually make a hole in space. I mean, sort of. And everything that falls into it cannot escape anymore. And even light that would travel around on the piece of paper, so anything that is on the piece of paper would be in space, and light as well, gets sucked into the black hole. If you're close, if you're too close, yeah, uh, a black hole that's far away, it's not a problem. Yeah. So there is actually a really massive black hole uh, in the center of our galaxy. It's about, uh, I think, two million solar masses, so the mass of the sun about two or three million times. Um, yeah, but you can also have smaller black holes. Uh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question is by Asanis. Hi, my Hi. name is Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. Uh, 
scientists say that in a clear night we can see the Milky Way galaxy. Is it true? Then if so, how can we see it? Uh, what can we see? The, the first part. Can you repeat the first part of the question? Scientists say that in a clear night we can see the Milky Way galaxy. Is it true? Huh. If so, then yeah, um, the, Milky Way. the Milky Way. Yes, yes. Yeah, if I the Milky Way in a clear night, can we see? Yes. Um, yeah, actually, maybe I say can something to this. Um, so um, that is something that has been, I don't know, a lot of interest for myself too, because something I was always wondering about, because I live in the city as well, so I'm more like one of the kids that have grown up in the city area. So, but something that I was always told is that. A few years ago, actually not living in cities, you could actually see a lot of, let's say, celestial objects that we have in space with your own clear, with your own eyes at night. And yeah, it's, it's something I could never really believe. But if you, there are a lot of cool videos on YouTube. If you look, for example, at the um, Hawaiian telescopes, I can put a link into the uh, um, after the after the uh, telecom, but you can actually see how the sky really looks like if you have a very low light, but the problem is that we have um, a high amount of so-called light pollution. So um, light and being emitted from the cities that we have, and the area where this light is being emitted, which is actually blocking you view into space with your own eyes, is actually pretty far. So I don't know if we have one city that actually maybe even let's say 50 kilometers away that you couldn't even see a clear sky, which is actually a cool thing. For a lot of people, because they can actually never really see the Milky Way with their own eyes in this one way. Okay. Robert, you'd like to add something more? Um, yeah, I wanted to add the video, but I will add it um, towards the end of the discussion. So there's a video which actually shows this thing. So you can actually just look it up on YouTube and I will post it to the chat fence, the chat window. Sorry. Okay. Uh, you will get the link later for a video, okay? Okay, okay next question by Riza. Is it possible to go, go outside the solar system and reach other galaxies? And what about the research on other galaxies? Okay, is it the question? The question was. Is it possible to go outside of the solar system and reach other galaxies, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. In, in general terms, of course, it's possible, but uh, not with the technology that we have today. Or uh, let's say it would take a really long time. That's the point. So you can actually reach any point in space, but it, the space travel really, really, really takes a long time because of the low velocities that we have. So there are some ways that we've developed some technologies that are based on ion thrusters, for example which actually accelerate all the time. So there's actually something, for example, if you start uh, a spacecraft in, in Earth orbit with an ion engine, then it actually is really slow at the beginning, but it gets faster, faster, faster over time. And it can actually reach very high velocities. Um, but the normal spacecraft that we currently use, which are use liquid rocket fuel, they actually, yeah, at some point the rocket fuel is, is, is gone, and then you actually don't no longer have any acceleration. And yeah, as I said, it's of course possible, but it really takes a long time. And actually, that's actually something that we, I didn't think, I personally think that will at some point revolutionize space travel if we find a way to maybe make a shortcut for this, or maybe travel faster in space. Yeah. Maybe you could want to add something um, for the uh, space travel times to Mars in this world, because I think it could be interesting. Apparently. Okay. Uh, yeah, so. Um, yeah, like Robert said, to go out of the solar system at the moment, it takes a very long time. For example, the Voyager probe, it took more than 30 years to get there. Um, to go to Mars, for example, which is actually uh, like our neighboring planet, and uh, Venus on the other side and Mars are the closest planets to Earth. But to go to Mars, it takes at least uh, half a year um, if you're really fast. But you can also, if you don't want to invest so much money uh, and we want to take less fuel, you can also go to Mars and it takes you five years or ten years. So it, it really depends what you want to do. Um, but with the, mm -hmm. if you take the best rocket you have, uh, the biggest rocket and a really small satellite, 
then you can send it really fast away. So for example, there is a mission to Pluto, uh, New Horizon. Uh, I think it will arrive in two years or three years. And uh, when it gets there, it, it actually took only, I think, less than 10 years to get there to Pluto. Yeah? And Pluto is, all, well, very far outside already. Yeah? So it really depends what kind of rocket you take. OK? Okay, next question is by Abin Trico, a young student is asking. Sir, uh, it is said that the man's blood circulation is due to gravitational force. In space, there is no gravitational force. Then, how do human beings' blood circulation look at space? Okay, can you please repeat? Uh, so he's asking. Uh, usually, it is said uh, blood circulation in human bodies because of gravitational force. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Gravitational force. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so he's asking. Space, there is no gravitational force. No. Then no, no, of course there is. There's always some gravitational force, but it's not like you're not just standing on the ground as you're standing here on Earth. And actually, this is an issue for human beings in space. So it's actually a good question for the OBF because they're doing a lot of work towards this. But um, let's say a human being in space, with, which does not have the same gravitational pull that you have here on Earth, it actually goes to a lot of onto your muscles and bones. And yeah, that's actually makes space travel a little bit complicated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, to gravity on itself, I mean, gravitation, the force itself, expands uh, to infinity. Yeah, So you will never be at a point where there is uh, no gravity. But um, it, it is a, such a weak force that when you're far away, you actually don't really feel it anymore. Yeah, But uh, actually, a uh, good point is, for example, on Mars, Mars has lower gravity, so you feel lighter on Mars. So if you have like 100 kilograms on Earth, uh, you would only have like 40 on Mars. Yeah? But uh, for example, on the space station, actually, they are in the, in the gravity field of Earth. They, they are not, um, they're not in space so far away that Earth doesn't affect them. But the thing is, on the space station, they move so fast that they feel like in zero gravity and it's like in free fall. So be, for example, if you go, um, uh, uh, I don't know, if you fall down somewhere, for a very short time you're in free fall and then uh, you're also weightless. But usually on Earth, uh, if you fall down, either you fall down a stair and that you don't feel that, or uh, you fall down from somewhere really high and then you're skydiving or something. But uh, yeah. <laughs> but gravity is everywhere. It just uh, depends how you feel it. And also it affects a lot of the work that you're doing towards space, um, space hardware development. So something that we've realized is, of course, something that's, good, it's, that's a well-known fact is that the moon only has one-sixth of the gravity of Earth, which actually doesn't make it easier to develop technology for the moon. So for example, the first prototypes that we built, I think I can show you this very good, um, Actually, as you said, we have a so-called. Let's, let's just give me this into the picture. And yeah, okay, that should be. So one thing that we that our rovers have is a so-called active suspension system, which enables the wheels to um, go up and down, so it actually can easy more easily climb over um, little rocks. But the problem is that this active suspension system has to be adjusted for a certain, let's say, a certain. The movement areas, and the point is that this adjustment is not the same on the Earth as on the Moon because of the one sixth of gravity. And that's a little bit of an issue because the very first prototypes that we've built, we've, built it, we've designed them for the Moon, but tried to test them here on Earth, and they totally failed because I don't know, we don't have one sixth gravity here, and that is actually something that we didn't took into account when building these very first prototypes. This was a very stupid mistake, but yeah. It's one of these mistakes that you actually made when you do space exploration work. That's a problem. So actually, you can't really just build the same hardware that you're going to send to another spot. You can at some point, but it, it makes things a little bit complicated. OK. OK, OK, thank you. Next, uh, Stephanie would like to ask a question. Stephanie? 
Is it possible to discuss the space satellites in space with the farming edge environment? So, uh, can you please repeat it? Is, uh, is it possible to discard the satellites, no, ex uh, expand satellites, that satellites uh, discard the space without causing any uh, difficulty in the environment? Um, the farming environment. I didn't even understand the question. Sorry. Is it possible to discard the satellites, no? I mean, uh, this called the expense satellites. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand uh, the question. Uh. Is it possible hmm? uh, to discard the expense satellites or spaceships to the space without harming the environment there? Hmm? Okay. Are you able to catch the question? No. Do you, do you, do you mean to build satellites in space or no? Uh, uh, satellites which are not functioning, no? Dead. Okay. So, uh, the satellite so, so, is, is it possible to actually build a spacecraft in space? Sorry, I just want to make sure. No, no, no. The question is, uh, the, the satellites which have finished their mission, no? They are, uh, they are existing, uh, their function will be not, not be there. So they are the base materials in the uh, space environment, right? So is it possible to discard these uh, uh, finished satellites, that mission finished, mission completed satellites, without uh, making any harm to the space environment? So if the uh, 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 oh okay, uh, are are you talking about um uh, gar well um uh, garbage in space like like old satellites that uh. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, that are not uh, functioning anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, Robert? <laughs> yeah, maybe. So, actually, there's. Um, so, um, yeah, actually, um, having old satellites or old hardware in space actually is a really big issue. And because it really affects all the missions that go to space. and. There is a lot of research being done to get rid of old satellites before they cause an issue. So, for example, if a satellite, let's say, collides, if a damaged satellite collides with another damaged satellite, then you actually end up with a lot of tiny pieces which are scattered um, across space, which actually also can damage other spacecraft. So, one thing, for example, a project that the uh, German Aerospace Agency, the DLR, has been developing is uh, the, you know, it's called, it's called deorbiting satellites services or satellite system. So the actually the goal is to build a small satellite on itself which flies into space, finds a damaged satellite, attaches to it and throws it into the atmosphere. So it actually burns down. So it's a little bit like the version of garbage man into in space. <laughs> it doesn't solve all of the problems but it really helps um, circumvent the future problems that we all might have. Okay. Okay. Um, the uh, I, I'm, afra I'm afraid uh, we only have time for one more question because we need to prepare for yeah. the oh. next telecon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so one man actually is asking a question. It's the last question, as you said. Okay. What are your future plans in space research and future research? Sorry. Okay, what are our uh, next uh, space uh, plans, especially to reach Mars? Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then because it's of Mars, then I think it's a perfectly PDU subject, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the question is what are the next plans to go to Mars, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. We would like to also come with you. <laughs> okay. We would like to also join with you. Well, uh, there are a lot of plans to go to Mars because Mars is a really interesting place and uh, it's actually the most Earth-like planet we have in the solar system. And uh, the next mission that is actually planned to be going there is uh, um, it's ExoMars, cannot. Um, but actually, we have an expert here on uh, Mars mission that is uh, actually uh, Gernot Grömer, our uh, president of the Austrian Space Forum. So maybe you would like to answer that question about uh, the future Mars missions. Future Mars missions. Would you like sure. to?
Sure. Okay, so uh, for the last question, we actually get the president of the Austrian Space Forum to answer your question, okay? Good evening, India. Thank you. Good evening. Okay, so as for the question for the next Mars missions, yes, there is a mission plan from the US side already uh, launching uh, next year. Uh, we are also looking into a mission for uh, looking into atmospheric compositions of Mars because we believe that they are a very important clue for uh, studying the climate history of Mars and maybe even searching for uh, gaseous traces of life if they exist on Mars. For 2018 plus, uh, we hope from the European side there will be the European uh, ExoMars rover, uh, where we have actually also a roving vehicle on the surface. Uh, but I think the most important issue is that uh, we still believe that the next human Mars mission will be happening within the next 20 to 30 years or so. And that actually means if you assume that uh, the uh, very human to walk on Mars uh, is uh, might be like 40 years old at that time, that means that those people who will be doing the first step of this grandest journey of our generation, so to say, uh, will have the age of like uh, 10, 15 years now. And they might be right now going to a school in New Delhi. Who knows? So I'm very much convinced that the very first human to walk on the red planet is already born and has somewhat the age of your students right now. Who knows if the first human, first male or female to walk on Mars is sitting in that very audience here in there right now. <laughs> okay, I'll pass back to our telecom console. Thank you for the answer. Uh, will you please excuse me? One girl is interested in the last question she's going to ask. Will you please give one more question? Time for one more question. Um, um, it, it has to be the very last question and a very short answer because we really need to get on with the next telecom. So please. Where is International Space Station? Is it near Moon? Is it near Mars? Is it near Uranus? Is it in the outer space? Okay. The question was where is the International Space Station? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, Robert, would you like okay. to have the honors of answering the last question? Yeah, I can actually answer yeah, so it pretty quickly. It's actually around, it's orbiting around the Earth, and it's not around the Moon or Mars. But there actually have been people who actually suggested of using something like an international space station to get to Mars, which was quite interesting. But um, yeah, actually, right now it's orbiting the Earth, and you can actually see it at some point in the night sky. So there are actually websites like watchiss.com, if I'm correct. Where you can actually see the times. You just enter where you are, and you can actually see the times where you can see the ISS with your own eyes in the night sky. It does not happen very often, but it happens from, I don't know, certain time into them. Okay. So, okay. with this. Thank you. Uh, with thank you. Uh, on our institution, Sigan and Academy of Excellence, would like to thank you. It's a wonderful evening. We had nice experience, amazing, wonderful experience. We are able to talk to you. We, must, uh, we are thanking you, congratulating you for giving this wonderful opportunity. Uh, our students all would like to clap and thank you. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, I put a, I put a link into the chat window which is um, shows something that you can explore with your students um, after the call. It's, uh, the lunar surface, it's a lunar surface simulation developed by our team where you can actually drive the rover around the uh, surface area of Apollo 17, and it's based on the original data of the Apollo mission. So it's a very scientific model, but it's cool to just explore the surface. Okay. So, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you India, for uh, joining us here, and uh, thank you, Robert, for yeah, presenta presenting your work. So with this, uh, I will have to end the broadcast, and I hope you will... Uh, Continue with uh, the World Space Week uh, in your locations, okay? So with this, uh, okay. greetings from Austria, and goodbye. 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 Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.